welcome to the Mariah Jean Fit YouTube channel. I'm Coach Mariah. Make sure you like our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos as much as possible so we can reach a broader audience. We appreciate your support and enjoy the video. Hi guys, welcome to the Fit Minds podcast with coach Mariah Jean and today we are interviewing Joe Williams. He is one of my long-term friends from my early years, my teenage years. We have grown up together and um, we worked together for a few years as well. We probably didn't really talk for a few years there, no, um, yeah, both kind of lost contact, but randomly ran into each other at a gym. Um, I think it was probably like a year and a half ago, yeah, something like that. that. Yeah. And uh, we decided to interview Joe because he is an elite athlete. He has been um, in the sporting world, in the, the realm of bobsledding for the past couple of years. And I'm super excited to dive into a couple of questions about that. I've been really on the edge of my seat to find out about things like your overseas travel and, and the like. So, and getting into the mind of an elite athlete, you know, not just around bodybuilding, but this type of mentality um, required for, you know, really high level training sports. So let's dive into the questions. I know we've already like covered that, <laughs> but tell me a little bit about your background. Well, we grew up in Bundy, yep. um, obviously. And if I speak a little bit weirdly, it's because that comes out every now and then <laughs> when I'm talking to people from Bundy. <laughs> um, yeah, what well, we worked together at the Senny for like three, four years, mm. a little while there. So yeah. that was... Weird time of our lives, I guess. Yeah, it kind of feels like it was like a, um, almost like a bubble that we were in yeah, for, definitely. for like, that time. So easy to get stuck in those little bubbles too, I think, especially mm. like with hometown sort of stuff. But um, I mean, you've gone off and done some phenomenal things and I can see all your trophies sitting here. So <laughs> before we talk about me too much, congratulations on what Thank you've you. done. Thanks. It's awesome to see. Yeah. Your little empire that you're building. It's good. Yeah. So... Thanks for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it. happy to be here. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so I just grew up playing heaps of sport. Hey, mm -hmm. I love sport. Uh, I've always been really into it. And I've been lucky enough to be able to play a number of different sports. Um, and I've also been lucky enough to be gifted with decent, fast genetics. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much on how all that sort of stuff works. But essentially, my dad was fast. My uncles are fast. Mm. I got really lucky and they taught me how to run from a young age. Nice. Um, and I carried that through with all sports that I played. Then let's just go all the way through to bobsledding. Essentially, yeah. I started track sprinting for a while. Yeah. Um, and I went down to Victoria to do some gift racing. And um, I just got approached. They, they asked me to try and join the squad to go to tryouts. And wow. Honestly, I thought it was a joke. Yeah, you were like, this guy's me. like the Australian bobsled team. And I'm like, get out. <laughs> You're like, like, like that movie, right? I've seen the Jamaican movie, <laughs> mate. Like, I've seen Cool Runnings. How is um, it a thing? Yeah. Yeah, but it's legit. Um, I went to a testing camp and scored pretty well. And about six weeks later, I was in Norway going down a track. So Wow. Yeah. Mind wow. blowing. Had you ever been overseas prior to that trip? or? So prior to that trip, I had, I had, I went through Europe, just tourist touristy yep. sort of Europe um, through France, Spain, Italy, Greece, just yep. doing the Instagram photo stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Making sure you get by the Eiffel yeah, Tower. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I had actually never seen snow though. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy I mean, to think that. Yeah. Like you started in Australia kind of just practicing and, and being invited to this stuff and then yeah. you've just been catapulted into these, these yeah, countries. Yeah, literally it was wild, hey. It felt like... Um, Probably the first month over there really just felt like a dream. Like you wake up and it's white everywhere outside. Wow. It's freezing cold, mm. which wasn't used to, but I didn't mind it. Mm. Um, and yeah, like just just the change of, I guess, scenery. Like it's, it's just wild to wake up every day in that sort of, in those beautiful areas of the world. Like mm. I... I I love Norway. It's phenomenal. Lillehammer is where we were and it's such a pretty place to be. Yeah. Um, it was a little bit contrasting because we're in such beautiful areas and then we're going to a bobsled track to <laughs> rip it down the ice. Gr and yeah, get, grind it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get, get, um, get mashed in the back of a sled. So, wow. Yeah, but yeah, it was good fun. 
That's amazing. It's really interesting to hear about how you got into it because I think that we often, I guess, wonder where all that started and like, you know, what planted that seed for you. Mm. Um, and the fact it's come from your sprinting background or your, your running background is, is phenomenal. I was a, an athletic sprinter in, in high school as well. And the same thing came from genetics where yeah. both my parents were sprinters and jumpers yeah. and um, I went in the direction of bodybuilding of all yeah. places. But it is, it is interesting to th- see that genetics has a little bit to play in there. But I think that it's given more credit than it needs to be given because you've oh, got your hard work behind yeah. there, right? Like Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I'll probably just say that in the sense that that's where it started. Yeah, absolutely. In that environment where I was... Yeah shown those things Mm. um but moving on from that mate there's people in the squad there's guys in the squad that are shorter than me taller than me bigger than me smaller than me like you know and we're all pushing the same speeds like we're all as good as each other if if we weren't we wouldn't be there like a good four-man team you all need to be on and like we're all on and we're all we came from different areas and Mm. and yeah like we got weightlifters that have transitioned no way yeah we got uh decathletes and all sorts of people, like we got rugby league players have come ha, over. And I was going to ask that course. question, actually. <laughs> so, hey, Kat, buddy. Cat, welcome to podcast. Um, I was going to ask that question. Um, sorry, I was going to ask that question about, you know, whether or not like football, I suppose, like rugby league players and stuff would be, you know, well, suitable for this type of sport. Yeah. So, um, you, you know, there, there could have been the, the potential of you going down that direction and yet you've gone down, you know, yeah. bobsledding. Well, I did play a couple of years of senior footy in Bundy. I, oh, um, yeah. Riley Webb and Kanan, oh, yeah. the old boys. <laughs> the crew. Yeah. 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 Um, I honestly just didn't enjoy it that much um, compared to running. I don't know what it is about it's running a rush. fast. Yeah, it's, it's a rush. I can say that my sprinting days, probably of all the sports I tried... I miss the 100 meter, yeah. I miss the 200, yeah. It's probably that, yeah, that, that that technical aspect of flying down the track. like it's, You do it's, feel like that, yeah. Yeah. It's, you, yeah, anyway. You get a rush. You're an adrenaline Absolutely. junkie, I would I, say. As you can tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. so on the topic of, um, I guess, like the whole what's involved with it, because we do see, we've seen, we've seen the movie. I know it's such a cliche thing to say, but in Australia, that's all we've really got yeah. of the sport. You know, what's involved in, in that? Like, you said there's four men in a team. Like, what yeah. does it look like for a typical race? Um, or if we, yeah, so if we just talk about race day. Mm-hmm. Race day is probably pretty similar across most sports. You know, mm-hmm. you've, you've done your preparation. You've had your practices. You, you'd have your girls doing practice stuff now. Yep. We do the same thing. We just practice it on the track. Yep. Um, so let's say race day, we'll wake up probably five to six hours before race time. Mm-hmm. We want to be really awake when it comes time to, to race. Yep. Um, probably avoid caffeine for a, a couple of hours. Interesting. Why, why do you avoid caffeine? Uh, we, well, I'd have enough to absolutely kill a horse <laughs> about an hour and a half to, to right. an hour after, before the race. Yeah, right, okay. But yeah. I wouldn't want to be g up and then having that, you know, four and a half hour sort of down. There's no yeah. window, I think, like, you know, around that four hours b- b- prior, we know that there is no proof to show yeah. that caffeine is good then, you know. You're right. Yeah. Like, loading it right before, you know, yeah. um, the, the race time. Is yeah, I think 20 to 40 minutes before is kind nice. of what we, we get told to do. Yeah. And, and I have a nice little resume in there or system in there that I go with. So. Yeah. You know what's interesting? It is different for every person as to what their, you know, pre-game or pre-race day looks like. Mm. I think that there's, you know, maybe some placebo, but there's a lot behind um, and, and a lot to say for it as well as a sports nutritionist that um, each individual person is going to have slightly different requirements, you know, from like a hydration perspective and everything like yeah. that. So, yeah. yeah, there's a bit of yeah, preparation. Definitely. Yeah, mm. like, I mean, like my, and this is my race day I'm talking about here. Yeah. Like, I'm big on music. I love nice. listening to music. Bit of serotonin. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's not necessarily. I mean, I'll I'll actually tee off with a bit of country to start the day with. What? Some, yeah. That's the Bundy coming out of you. <laughs> That's the Bundy coming out. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Do you I'll, tell I'll anyone that? Does anyone yeah, hear the it? Yeah, the boys. The boys in the squad know because we listen to Chicken Fried on the way to the track. Jesus. Or well, something like that. We won't hold that against you. Joe. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, it starts off with for me. Yeah, like music is huge. You know. Yeah. Um, Pre-race nutrition is pretty simple. I'll probably start the day with like maybe a bacon sandwich, something something like that. But then pre-race nutrition would be like a muesli bar, nice porridge, yep, something pretty carby. Yep. Um, I'd want to have my 
protein earlier in the mm-hmm. day away from race time because sure. I don't want to be sluggish breaking down, da- breaking that down when I'm trying yep. to perform. So you obviously, you know a lot about that. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then, yeah, I don't know, a uh, couple of Red Bulls or something actually prior Just to the race. Just a couple of Red Bulls. <laughs> and, and it all, it all goes in the same time as like I'll start to warm up, warming up um, probably occurs about two hours to an hour and a half before mm. we actually go. And that's on a really slow sort of slope upwards in intensity. It's all very movement based, not doing a lot, just mm-hmm. sort of jogging around, doing some turnovers and stuff. And mm-hmm. then um, slowly increase the speed of what you're doing. Sure. So the intensity kind of like increases as you get yeah. closer to the race. Yeah. But the movements pretty much stay the same for me. Sure. So I'll do the same thing, but I'll mm. do it for about an hour. Yep. And I'll slowly increase that Interesting. Uh, intensity prior to racing yeah um and that comes back to trust in my previous off-season training yeah and what i've done before the only reason that would be modified if it is if i was injured or something like that sure yeah coming closer to race time a bit more caffeine the music switches to a bit more heavy yeah. angry stab someone type music. <laughs> <laughs> so um <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't actually do that, but yeah, get get a bit more angry and yeah. then yeah, finally, you know, sleds prepped um, by the guys that aren't racing mm-hmm. and that means, so they put the runners on, they, they tightened all up and check the sled and make sure it's good, just walk out onto the ice. Um, What's that feeling like when you come out? Is your heart like beating through your chest before it oh, yeah, happens? I imagine you, you felt a very similar feeling walking out on stage. I mean, like for a national event though, we're talking, or international event, I suppose, if you're, you're traveling overseas, you know, you've just recently yeah, come okay. back from that. Yeah, so. it's, um, it's big. I always, in the locker room, I always start to think about how I got there and whose um, shoulders I've stood on right. to be there. Yeah. So, you know, it starts with like my parents, you know, my, my brothers, my sister, I always think about them and making sure that I'm making them proud of my performance. Mm. Um, and then people that have sponsored me mm. or... Um, you can plug your sponsors in this podcast, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, fit stop. <laughs> um, yeah. Just stay in the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Into parcel. Um, yeah, yeah um, you know, it's start to think about people, individual people that have sponsored me, you know, their own sure. cold hard cash. Um, yeah, wow. You know, they've just to help us out. And um, I think about them and, and making sure that, you know, they're... I'm returning mm. what they've given me. The investment. Um, and that, that gets me going better than anything else. It does, honestly. It? Like, yeah. um, you know, you're absolutely right. It is an international event and I'm brushing shoulders with the, you know, the Canadian Olympic team or the, wow. you know, the American Olympic teams or like the Russian teams or the Austrian teams. Like, and I don't really think about them um, like that when I'm there. They're just people. Yeah. doing the same thing that I'm doing. Yeah. I'm going to try and do it better than them. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'm just trying to do the best I can so that when I go home and shake hands with people that have helped me get there, mm. I can say, look, I did the best that I could. Yeah, So absolutely. So it comes from the heart. It's not like it's from a position of, you know, wanting to win or anything like that. Because I think that can often be, uh, I wouldn't say the wrong way of going about a competition, but you do see a lot of people coming in and saying, if I don't win, then... This is the end yeah. for me, you know, and mentally that's, that destroys them. Yeah. See, the finish line is a product yeah. for me. It's a product of everything else that's added up to get there. Yes. And it's also not necessarily guaranteed in a bobsled race. You right. You might not make it across the line. If you crash, you might not get there. That's heartbreaking. Sometimes you do get there. You just get there upside down. But, um, you know, you I know, mean, where it's there's best a to not away. get there yeah. upside down. Yeah. It's a lot more comfortable. Um, yeah, wow. So what are like, you know, I suppose along that the lines of that, um, what does it look like from like injury perspective as well? Like, do, do you get hurt in this type of stuff? Mm. Wow. Like, yeah, so we could have um, a clean run down the track and you'll end up covered in bruises. Jeez. So, yeah, we just sit on carbon fibre um, and steel. Right. So there's no cushions. It's pretty brutal. There's no, yeah, it's yeah. all... It's all the sled weighs exactly what you need it to weigh. Mm. Um, there's no room for fluffies in there, like little cushions or anything like that. You wow. Just, you're sitting and on, on ice too, like that's... On, yeah, actually, which is, is it on ice? Yeah. Yeah, which is surprisingly hard, hey. Like, yeah. I mean, we all know ice is hard, but this 
I've when been ice. I've been ice skating, it? and I, yeah. I fell over like numerous times. So yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't know how you could navigate. You know, wow. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, it's rock hard. Hey, like it's crazy. Mm. Um. I, yeah. So in, injury wise, I've been upside down a couple of times, and I've had some pretty bad stacks. Gnarly. Yep. I've had some stacks where it's not that bad, but that's just part of the sport. Yep. So like um, any i suppose is always that risk factor yeah there's huge risk yeah yep. absolutely the hardest probably probably the hardest thing with bob and like learning and crashing is that um you crash if you want to get better you just have to pick your sled up go back to the top of the mountain and start again it's very humbling and, um oh yeah very humbling yeah. yeah so um i suppose now we've kind of covered what you know bobsledding looks like and you know for those out there that i suppose we've kind of we've only seen like the pretty side of it um what does a training week look like for you typically because you've got all of that lead up to you know events and we know that you know like us in bodybuilding we've got two seasons in a year and people i've had this you know assumption that there's just shows all the time but obviously there isn't events all the time what does it look like your day in the day in the life of joe and, and training and and i suppose the building towards events and competitions, you know, in the lead yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, off season training or pre season training, or I, I would break it down personally into three sections, which is off season, sure. pre season, and then in season. Um, off season training is eat a lot, sleep a lot, lift heavy weights. And when we're talking fast. about eating a lot, like calorie wise, like yeah. So f- I, w- I would be. You probably, I, you probably hate that question. They're like, how much do you eat? Yeah, people yeah. love asking that. Hey, yeah. um, at the moment, it's actually not that much. Well, sure. I'm at a level now where I don't need to put on any more weight. I just need to increase power. Maintain, yeah, and, yeah. yeah, maintain. Um, yeah. So, but I was 84 kilos when I was sprinting. Wow. I put on. Well, I got up to 114 kilos. What is that doing for your joints? Like that would just be that'd be crazy. It's like it's like literally putting on like a small human being worth of weight. Yeah. So it took me two years to yep. put that on. Um, I got faster over thirty meters. Yeah. Um, wow. With more weight. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. But I went from squatting one hundred and sixty, one hundred and seventy kilos to squatting two hundred and sixty kilos in sets of three to six. I have seen your squat sets. There. It, it <laughs> literally. It looks. Oh God. It looks like um. It's still filming. Um, <laughs> uh, I've seen your squat sets. It literally looks like like torture, really, watching you do those sets. Yeah, it's, yeah. Anderson squats are something that changed my life. Mm. What's um, an Anderson squat? Explain. <clears throat> so you would put the bar mm-hmm. at the lowest point of your squat mm-hmm. and you start underneath and push out. Oh, yuck. Yeah. So that's like from from depth. Yeah, from depth. So it'd be just under ninety sort of degrees. Just I've under never like even tried thing. that. I've yeah. never even because we we so, often have that focus to get to depth, but mm. it would be incredibly humbling to come out of a depth squat and try and you know try and push this heavy weight that we're you know pushing in PBs. Yeah, well, so I got to a point where I was squatting you know two twenties to two forties pretty effectively, and mm. the next step on that would be to, if I continue to increase that weight. I don't think. And my, my S&C coach, we talked about it and we didn't think that it would actually provide me with any power creation. Sure. I would get stronger, but then I run the risk of getting slower. Yep. Um, so it's that perfect balance between like <clears throat> power and strength. Yeah, exactly. And so I'd be, I'd be squatting, I'd be lifting on one day and sprinting the next day or sometimes lifting then sprinting or sprinting then lifting. Do you um, always alternate between the two? Um, no, not always. No, it would just depend on what time of season it is and what oh, yeah. I'm trying to do with sure. that block. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, so for example, yeah, like I, instead of continuing to increase the weights with squats, we increase the intensity by making them Anderson squats yeah. instead. So, yeah. and then I got that to 240 ish sort of kilos and moving it at, at, at the Queensland Academy of Sport and they're using a, um, piece of fishing line on a motor that's reading how fast I was moving <laughs> it so moving that at just a, just under a meter a second which wow. is pretty good so yeah. and you know that and that that all gets to a stage so everything we do or everything I would do I would try and get to a stage where I'm good enough or effective enough in that movement mm-hmm. and then I'd try and figure out a way to make it even more effective mm. um 
so <clears throat> so that would be pre-season uh, sorry that would be off-season training style stuff okay I wouldn't be doing a lot of that pre-season because you get so tired. Sure. And obviously, are you looking at, you know, reducing caloric intake down into pre-season or like, do you um, have to make a certain weight? Like, how does all that work? So making weights is an interesting um, part of the sport. So there's a combined total weight for sleds. Oh, right. So you'll want to be about 100 kilos. Um, but <clears throat> From 114 down to 100, it's like cutting for a <clears throat> bodybuilding show or for MMA yeah. or, yeah. So I've been lucky in that my um, <laughs> my team have all been slightly lower, so I can ah, stay a little bit heavier. Yeah, so which you're I like, like to do. You're like the big big boss man of the whole <laughs> team. <laughs> Not the big boss man, yeah. but um, I am at the moment. I think I'm the biggest in the squad. Yeah, yeah. but that doesn't really mean that no. much. I'm just making up weight so that they sure. don't have to do it. Do you know what I mean? So it's definitely a team sport. It really oh, is. Oh yeah, you can't be hurtling down the ice at 140 clicks no. if you don't get on with the bloke behind you. <laughs> right. Not saying we get on all the time, but yeah. generally we get on. We've probably taught you a lot about, I suppose, like the next topic I'd like to go into is, um, you know, the camaraderie side of things, the side of, you know, because you, you get really close to these guys in the time that you've been training with them. Like, does the team stay the same? Does it, do they become your best mates? Like, how does this all work from a friendship and sporting perspective? Yeah, so, I mean, we demand a lot from each other. Yeah. And so that's always going to get a little heated. But there's pretty good, healthy competition in there. Mm -hmm. um, i got, I got to say, I, I wouldn't be the brake man I am mm -hmm. um, without Dylan. He's one of my other teammates. And we've sort of been in it together from the start. Yeah. Um, and Evan's our pilot. He's been our pilot from the start. But as far as brake men go... Yeah, I he he's been the guy that him and I have been through the most together, mm. um, and he pushed me to be better. Yeah, and I think he would say the same that I pushed him to be better. We just mm. demand a lot from each other, yeah. um, but it's good when it comes to training, mm. right? So when you have someone like that that's keeping you accountable. Um, you don't want to let them down. Mm. They don't want to let you down. Mm. Um, there's obviously going to be a bit of banter involved all the time. And we used to have like, um, we had uh, like little competitions every Monday who could run the fastest through the 30 or who had like performance <laughs> of the session and stuff like that. And that was adjudicated on by another one of the blokes in the squad. Lovely. Pat. Yeah. And um, we're all, we all get on well, but like, you know, I don't know, one. Someone's got to lose, right? Yeah, and this, yeah. These little, like, <laughs> these very official races that we're having, yeah. right? And no one, no one in the squad likes losing. Right. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. None of us like losing. Yeah, I can so. imagine this could this could be a recipe for disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Just make sure there's yeah. no, like, heavy boots <clears throat> around to throw at each other or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. But, it like, on tour, it's the same thing. It's exactly the same. It's like we're training, but we're mm. not. We're on tour. Mm. Um, yeah. But we, obviously, we know that there's a deadline for races. Mm. So each week or race week or whatever, mm. doesn't matter what's going on externally or, sure. you know, someone might have eaten an extra piece of steak that you wanted or something mm. at dinner last night and mm. you want to get into fisticuffs or mm. too bad, like it's race day tomorrow. Got to get along. Put your ego aside and let's get this thing done for, for each other. So yeah. Yeah, we do come home and like we don't talk for like a month. Yeah, because you've been but in we've each just other's been, spaces. Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah like, and we're, we're sleeping in... Tiny yeah. little cabin rooms in ski areas, like. So it's not. I suppose it's like you know, traveling for for sporting reasons and everything. I think that especially um, from an outsider's perspective, it can be very romanticized. Mm. You know, like oh, you're on the Australian <laughs> team, and yeah. you know, you go overseas, and like this is happening, and there's all these, you know, like um, you know, you get to stay in hotels and everything. And, <laughs> And it, it, I would agree with you it, there in it, that it always has to be done on a budget. Like there's always a, there's always going to be a situation, especially if you're in a team where you will be sleeping on top of each other, that type of stuff. So, you know, there's there's probably going to be that amazing travel side, but yeah, the, the downside is the yeah. Look, we we are in, and like I said before, we are in beautiful areas of the world, mm. places that are semi untouched, mm. like um, the wilderness sections in like. Canada that we saw. Yeah, wow. Beautiful. But yeah, we're going home to eat baked beans on toast <laughs> and sleep in a room half the size of this with wow. two other dudes. So, yeah. It's not yeah. not all it's cracked up to be. It's no. it is no. It's no. work. 
Yeah. At the end right. of the day, it's work. Yeah, yeah. Like we're we're overseas and we're having a good time, but we're working. And yeah. Yeah. So I suppose on that topic as well, like that kind of yeah brings me to my next point is what do you think that this whole world has done for your mental health? I know it's pretty a, a very deep question to ask, but um, I kind of obviously in this podcast we combine sports nutrition and uh, mindset yeah so i want to talk about number one yeah what it's done for your mental health and number two what i suppose now mental health means to you because um it's not often a topic we touch on with especially with men like we know that there's a huge stigma attached to it what has happened to you as a result of becoming an elite what i would call an elite athlete (laughs) um i'd love to um i'd love to be able to go back and talk to myself. Yeah. You know? Because you I learned so much. Yeah. Um, not just about me either, like about other people and, and, and the world and everything. It we live in a time now where everything's so accessible but we still don't access it. Yeah. You know, we're happy to sit by and ignore our cognitive bias and just go on with it, like you mentioned just then, like the stigma around men's health and mm. there's a lot of people that are trying to push and and make um, positive movements in, in men's health and mental health because mm. it is, it's a human issue. It's not a men's issue or a woman's issue. It's, it's a, not specific to one sex. No, sure. it's a human issue. The challenges that might be different. Slightly different, yeah. But it's a human issue. Um, I, I guess growing up in Bundy, I was around a couple of people that... Um, I think they really could have used with someone, you know, telling them that they're going to be all right, that it's, yeah. going, to, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about myself. I was definitely, I've been in situations where I've mm. questioned lots of things. Mm. But, you know, I um, when I was in grade 12, uh, I think you would know this very close friend to just about everyone in the school. Marcus Roberts mm. and um, and Nico, mm. um, two of our very good friends, they passed. And um, it was a really challenging time. And I mm. think it would have been awesome for it to be acknowledged publicly that, like, mm. we, we will be okay. Mm. It's okay to grieve. It's mm. okay to be sad. And um, it was a real turning point for me with my life. Um, and with what I wanted from like the future was was that sort of period of time, because then I, I needed to, I I needed to experience things, um, and and it's pushed me to where I am, and and um, I guess researching mental health when those things happened um, was something that I did myself. Mm. No one sort of told me to do it, but I was struggling. Mm. Um, with like, I guess like the, the humanity of it, Mm. the, the, the in like, you know, you, you're an 18 or 17 year old kid, you run around, you think you're infallible. Mm. You think nothing can happen. And then you start losing your friends. And you start to realize actually lots of things can happen. Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a big, we kind of, it was like one after the other, it felt like, you know, we had, um, yeah, we had Goody and then we had, um, uh, Nick Robotham as well and and there was just and then Marcus obviously when we lost Marcus yeah. it it was it was a lot it was a lot it was a lot to go through losing people and it's it's interesting because I think that the issue was much bigger in country towns I, I don't I don't think that maybe because in cities we don't see it as much because obviously it's you know a larger population and everything but yeah, it's yeah. I, it did. It felt like our friends were dropping off like flies, and that, you know, I think that we mm. we haven't even spoken about it. You know, like we no. don't we don't no, talk we don't, about it. You know, <laughs> and it, exactly like um, like Nick Robo. Oh mate, that 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 killed me. Mm. That because I love that guy. He was such a good dude. He, mm. we used to play soccer against each other, and um, he was I honestly as. I was young, but I looked up to him so much. Yeah. He was, know, a, he was it, a good kid. But it, it shows you how we only see what people want us to see. Oh, absolutely. And, um, like, I had no idea. And I think a lot of people had no idea. And if we knew, 
Who knows? Yeah. You know? And now look at us, what, nearly 10 years later or 10 years later and it's still happening all the time and people aren't talking about it. Um, so yeah, that's probably the biggest thing and, and it has taken bobsled and being an athlete to really open my eyes with that and become humble with that. Mm. But that's the biggest thing I wish. I wish I could talk to people or go back and and just let people have their say. Mm. I think a lot of people feel like they don't get to have their say. Yeah. Like they can't talk. They don't have their moment. Yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. very heavy Sorry stuff. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. It's actually, interestingly enough, wanted to talk about it. Um, yeah. And it's usually in podcasts and stuff like this where we're having conversations where it comes out because yeah. um, admittedly, I think that when we went through those very tumultuous, like it was a three to four year period, really. Like it was such a close space of time yeah. and our immediate friendship circle was, you know, we, we worked Ooh. with Marcus for three yeah. or four years. It was you, me and him at the, the back bar together. Yeah. And, um... I think the reality check, I don't necessarily think it means that, because I, I think I, I went through that stage as well, where I was mm. like, what could I have done? What could, what could I have yeah. said? You know, um, I saw Marcus a couple of weeks before he passed. I spent three, four hours with him in the car and um, it just seemed like him, you know? And I think that, I think that we don't give ourselves enough credit for the positions that we do have in people's lives yeah. and we have done, because you never know. It's interesting. You never know who you're currently helping. You know. Yeah. No. Yep. So I yep. think it's a good way to look at I it. I definitely agree. Yeah, with from you that there. perspective yeah. as well. I, I didn't mean to be um, no, pessimistic about no, it. No. No. I agree. I, that um, was where my head used to be. It yeah. was for, a, and I'm talking probably only until recently, maybe the last six months to a year, um, where I've kind of come to terms with the idea that with everything that happened, we were kids. Yeah, we were. You know, we were we were kids, and we were trying to have fun. Like our lives kind of revolved around, um, you know, we were like working in a nightclub and, yeah. and it was such a fun vibe. And I think that we lived off that. That was, that was all that we knew. And yeah. we didn't really know how to deal with this type of stuff. No. Didn't have the tools. You know, we certainly weren't, we didn't grow up in, and I love my family, but we didn't grow up in families where, um, mental health was something that was like a really common topic to talk about. Like even yeah. back then, like no, 10 years ago, not. like it was not. And it's still, I think it's better. I think it's a lot better. Mm. It's a lot better now. And it's a lot more public now. And I think if someone came to me when I was 18 years old and said I was struggling, mm. I would have no idea yeah, yeah. how to help them yeah. or what to do. I would sit in the car and talk mm. But I, 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 I wouldn't know. Now, I would be so forward in pushing them through the door of a psychologist. Yeah, correct. I would tie them up and drag them there. Like, Do you know what I mean? Like, It's yeah. at a stage now where I'm kind of like, I, I would feel irresponsible yeah. if someone mentioned something to me and I didn't follow up on it. You feel obliged almost. Yeah. 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 And, and, and you know what? That, in my opinion, that costs me nothing. Yes. It costs me nothing. If I had to take a day off work for it, mm. to, I don't To go care. with them or whatever, whatever you need to do. Who cares? Yeah. I don't care. I think it's important to understand that when you don't have the tools, it's okay. And you're not palming someone off. You're actually giving them a lifeline. Yeah, And definitely. it might be that you might know a psychologist or you might... 100%. You might not know a psychologist. You might just literally Google, you know, yeah. in the area yeah. for someone for them to see someone. There are social workers. There's Lifeline, but also too, I think that our position as you know, a friend to somebody, just sitting in the car and having a chat is actually often all they need. You yeah. know, especially with men as well. Like there's, you know, we only really saw that our personalities came out when we got drunk. Yeah. And yeah. and now our lives have changed. We're obviously we're not <laughs> drinkers now. <laughs> no. Well. I stopped drinking and I joined the Australian men's bob team. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's actually really crazy. It's really wild doing this podcast, talking about this topic as well, because um, not to say that everybody needs to go on from the nightclubbing world and working in a nightclub and, and everything like that to progressing onwards with, you know, like elite athlete, athletic sports and things. But I think that moving forward from it, we we kind of saw the destruction that, that we had in our lives and we mm. just we just 
chose to change that. We were just like, no, that's not who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. I've got to get my shit together. And we didn't succumb to that, which we should be very proud of. Yeah. You know, whether or not we're on a national team or not, <laughs> it's, um, it's crazy. So yeah. um, thanks for, for sharing that with us because I know that, yeah, that's some pretty heavy shit. But um, it's really important that we do talk about it and, and I, I guess address it from a male perspective. Cause, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I never... For, for the most part, never got to really talk to many of the boys about it, and um, I think it's time to to address things, you know, as we need to. Yeah. Um, moving on from there, I suppose I want to look at what the next five years looks like for you from a perspective, because I know that you're you're obviously studying, like you've got some other stuff going on that <laughs> isn't just bobsledding. Yeah, I started to um, just fill my cup with whatever I could. Right. So to speak. So yeah. I dove into physiology mm -hmm. um, and then that pushed me towards psychology. Oh, so wow. I okay. I am three quarters of my way through a uh, Bachelor of Psych at the moment. Um, I've actually just put that on hold to learn how to fly planes. What? <laughs> That's such a polar opposite to bobsledding in psychology. Like, uh, let's talk about that. What's, what's going on um, with the... Well, driving a bobsled is actually very similar to flying a plane. Mm. Aerodynamics. It's very small touches, very small, gentle. It, it seems like it's such a, and because at the start of the of the track you're pushing a sled down ice, you're absolutely smashing it. Mm. Um, so it's very aggressive. But mm. once you get in, and then you know your pilot has to drive. I've done a bit of driving myself. You got to calm right down. Yeah, right. And you can't make a single mistake because a single mistake probably means a crash. And a crash means the people in the back are going to maybe get injured. So flying planes, very similar. Mm. You, you don't want to make mistakes. Yeah. You can, but you don't want to. Calculated. Um, very calculated. So, yeah. So You've been um, enjoying that? Yeah, I love it. I think it's the most interesting. It just bridges so many things for me. Like, mm -hmm. for example, I never knew that a, um, a plane's wing actually creates its own lift oh wow yeah so everyone thinks that the propeller or the engine is what pulls a plane along and you sort of the air underneath you sort of pushes you up mm -hmm. well that's actually not what happens it's the wing it's the wing the shape of the wing the air moving over the top of the wing moves faster than the air underneath the wing and fast moving air creates a low pressure system wow which sucks the wing up a little bit that's crazy wild it's crazy to think that your like ideas of I suppose in, anything that you thought was true about you know even from bobsledding to yeah. like you know flying a plane to psychology. It's amazing what happens when you learn mm. and you think you think that you know everything already. Oh You're like, yeah, it's so. Oh yeah, learning is so humbling. You know, I'm, yep. I'm studying as well nutrition yep. at the moment, and it's funny we we kind of come out of our original studies and we're like yeah like fuck yeah, I'm so smart and I've got all this shit behind me and all this knowledge and I can't wait to science people. Yeah. And then you realise, I know nothing. I know absolutely yeah. nothing. And yeah. it's... It's so, yep. It's I, a really rewarding experience, I think. Yep. I, um, I have a huge problem with oversharing and being hyper fixated on things. When people want to talk about topics <laughs> and I just get tunnel vision and I'm just like oh my god how about this and this and this and this and let's research this and and everyone's just like we're just trying to have a conversation <laughs> man. Like, that's not a I bad thing I just caught up with you to have a coffee and you're telling yeah. me about all this I just came here for a podcast and you're teaching me how a plane's wing works like, I love up. it though <laughs> but no it's this is the type of stuff that people really enjoy in podcasts right it's because if you jump on a podcast and you're listening to something and it's just like I kind of have sometimes listened to a podcast and I've gotten five minutes into it. I'm like, this is trash. I'm turning this off. You get bored. Because they, there's this monotone voice and it, it, oh, it yeah. kind of doesn't feel like it's real. Yeah. yeah um, okay. But this is, this is real life stuff. This is, it's actually so intriguing. And this is part of why I got you here. <laughs> to see someone's mind, the way that you think and the way that you pursue different things in life. And also too, like the fact that you, you know... Um, not only are holding down a position where you're you know, in this team and you're training so heavily and everything like that, but you've taken on study. You're very, obviously very passionate about mental health because otherwise you wouldn't end up in psychology. And then yeah. you've gone, do you know what? It's a lot right now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause it 
and I'm going to go and do something that I know that I'm quite passionate about and I don't even know where this is going to take me. Yeah. But then you've discovered things about yourself in that process too. I yeah, love definitely. the idea of um, playing with different you know, different types of knowledge bases and actually having a collective of everything that you love and enjoy. Yeah. You don't have to be one specific thing. You don't have to fit that. You know, I'm not the stereotypical bodybuilder. I'm this like <laughs> super science geek chick that yeah. um, is very business driven as well, but I kind of fell into bodybuilding because of I was already training, you know, I was already yeah. there. So I think it's it's important to pay attention to this stuff. So yeah. no, I love it. I love learning about yeah. all of this. So the next five years, what does it look like? like so for the you? next five years, I'd love to finish. Well, so I'm enrolled in a Bachelor of Aviation with mm-hmm. CQU Uni. Yep. Um, and so I do my theory work with them. Mm-hmm. There's CASA is a Civil Aviation um, Australia mm-hmm. um, or authority, but um, they will provide like exams. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I will do actual flight training with a flight provider. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do all those three things and hopefully in three years time, if I can nail it, um, I'd have a commercial pilot license. Yep. Um, psychology is something that I will come back to, but not within five years. Mm. I'll probably try and finish the degree within five years, Mm. but I would like to practice when I'm another 10, 15, 20 years down the track in that yep. field. I think I feel like I'm still very immature in my head. Wow, that's, um, a, that's a big thing to say. Like for a dude <laughs> your age, like you're what, 28, 20? No, 30 maybe. Oh my God, yeah. here I am giving him some years. I'm 30 this year as well. I thought, I always thought we were the same age, but then I, for some reason, thought I we were younger. I definitely act young. Yeah. yeah. I act like a kid. <laughs> As you can tell. <laughs> just 114 30 years kilo old kid. and just bobsledding every week. <laughs> That's Parents awesome. Parents like, when are you going to grow up? Never. Never. I think it's, a, gonna, yeah. it's definitely a male thing though. I think that, yeah. I, you know what? Yeah. I don't think you should ever have to grow up though. No. I, do, I, th- I do think you've got to keep some sort of childlike state. Just because I think that the narrative says that as you get older, you have to be a certain type of person. Yeah, yeah. And that's just society creating that idea for us. 100%. Like, It's not... You know, I still play around. I'm still a kid. And I think some people probably look upon that and think, you know, get your shit together, like stop being silly, but always play. Playing yeah. is a part of life. It's a part of mental health. It's a part of keeping your shit together and, and staying sane. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to go for the white picket fence. You know, yeah. it's not, it's well, not it's the be like, all and end all. You know, that's like they say kids love athletes because athletes are just people that never stop playing. And having fun. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. And the rush from all of that as well. Yeah. So... Obviously, I suppose the burning question that I have as well on on topic of what's happening in the next five years, what have you got for events coming up? Like what's some really some big stuff coming? Because we know that now I know the Commonwealth Games have just happened. Mm -hmm. Um, We've got Olympics coming soonish. So Summer Olympics will be two years, but Winter Olympics is four years. Oh, shit. Okay, that's a while away. Mm. So, yeah. So I actually, in two weeks time, I'll be at the Queensland Academy of Sport again. Um... And we'll have like a combine. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're trying to bring in new athletes uh, to continue the sport. Mm. Obviously, as I just said before, I'm 30. Um, so <laughs> 30? 30. So <laughs> if I can get through another four years without any serious injury, mm. I would love to try and challenge for the next uh, Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am realistic mm-hmm. in understanding that I have been as we said, squatting 260 kilos Mm. every second day, running as fast as I can every other day, you know, rack pulling the same sort of weights. That's crazy. You you know, you're, you're like, you're a little bit mental, right? I actually, you know, it's, I never thought it was that much. Yeah. That's a lot though. I got humble. I'm not humble, but I, I got, um, someone the other day. Oh, that's not true. Someone a couple of years ago, probably two years ago, was, you know, we always say that the other day. But the other day. <laughs> oh, the other day. Literally when you, when you're 600 30. days ago. <laughs> when you're 30, it's just the other day. The other day, yeah. yeah. I wasn't 18, so it's the other day. <laughs> um, I was split squatting um, 220 kilos. and. Did you just split squatting? Yeah, yeah. Jesus. <clears throat> yeah. Um, For those of you out there that, that hate Bulgarian split squats, like... <laughs> 220 kilos bread and butter just what? eat them for breakfast you're disgusting yeah, that's disgusting um, yeah <laughs> um they hurt but oh like I'm surprised you didn't break a leg <laughs> oh you know that's another thing just quickly it doesn't get easier 
any of you out there that want to get easier. It doesn't get it. You get better. So it actually gets harder because yeah. you have to lift more. Correct. Or run faster. But you just embrace the, the shit feeling, don't yeah. you? You just kind of almost like... Yeah. Um, if you ever see someone at the gym doing a heavy weight and swearing, they're swearing at themselves because they're like, why am I still here? You yeah. know, why am I doing this to myself? It's yeah. We question our sanity. So yeah. 220 kilo Bulgarian yeah, split Yeah, sorry, squat. I was saying... Um, so I was doing that, yes, yeah, I was single banging something out and uh, a friend came to me and said, um, what are you doing? Like just some squats? And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, singles. And he was like, what do you mean? <laughs> I was like, I'm just doing singles. I, like I'll do another in about three minutes. Like I'll show you. And um, yeah, I ripped him. And he was just like, you know, I can't squat that right. Yeah. And I was like, yes, you can. He was like, no, I can't. So you're, you're an animal. I your like, idea nah, of what's man. normal like, is very skewed, right? Yeah. yeah, this literally happened in a conversation just the other day. A friend of mine, um, Ryan Chackley, he owns a couple of fit stop gyms and we were, we were talking about good training plug, stuff. Good plug, good plug. Yeah, yep. great plug, fit stop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and he said, uh, he was talking, he said, oh, you know, these such, a, I can't remember the context exactly, but someone had to be strong. Um, and I said, oh, that's not strong. And he was like, Joe, that's very strong. Mm. Like, I think we were talking about 180 kilo squat. That's strong. That's really strong. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. For some reason, my, in my head, I hear that word and I'm like, that's, we're on our way up. We're progressing. There's mm. a 75 percenter or something like that. You know, and, and it, did, it did show me how my mindset towards training has changed because mm. Definitely, four years, five years ago when I was sprinting, if you told me 180 kilos, mm. I would have straight up said that's strong. Mm. But now, I have done that for so long, it doesn't seem yeah, a lot yeah. to me. Yeah, it's all relative, isn't it? Like, yeah. To where you're progressing. I, I would agree, actually. I think like in my baby weights, you know, like let's just tone things down a little bit <laughs> because we're not all Joe Williams here. Yeah. <laughs> Years ago, I think a memory came up of me doing like 120 kilo leg press. And I think I weighed all of 55 kilos, you mm. know, back when I was anorexic and, and going through my, you know, awful like midlife crisis at 20. Um, when I went back to that and I looked at it and I was so proud of this 120 kilo leg press. And mind you, there are going to be, I've got clients who are doing that now and they're like stoked. And do you know what? I actually get excited with them because... I think that at any given point in time, no matter who you are, you're going to celebrate those checkpoints where yeah. you're kind of, your strength is increasing, where it is impressive, where you are, it's impressive and you should never compare yourself to someone else. We know that. But now I'm doing like 370 kilo leg press yeah, for the same yeah. amount of reps. And it blew my mind that I was so happy with that years ago. And now I've kind of got this like, I'm not going to be happy until I can press a car off me. Do you know, mm. like that type of mentality. So I guess, I suppose that leads me to my next point. Because I want to know like, do you think that do you think that you'll will ever you'll ever be satisfied? And do you think that that is a a part of you that I know deep right that is that is going to work against you, or perhaps that you can start to be happy with where you are now and that that really mindful like you know practice of gratitude for your insane accomplishments? And I'm not going to downplay it. Um, I I think I'm at a point here where I fluctuate so much. Um. Uh, not physically, mm. but with, say, sprint times, they are so affected by previous days' training or previous weeks' training or previous months' training Sure. that I'm not immune to it, but I don't pay attention that much. So you don't become so numbers-focused. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I would see the number, I know what it means, and I know what I need to do. Did it used to trigger you? Was it a big trigger previously? I stopped looking at my sprint times. For a long period of time, sure. I just stopped looking. My coach would look at it, write it down, yeah, um, and I would, I would just ignore it mm. because I, I got to a, a point in the middle there where I was putting on weight. I lost the abs a mm. little bit, as you do. Um, I was moving ridiculous weights. I was running ridiculously quick for a hundred plus kilo guy. Mm. But I wasn't running as fast as I was running when I was smaller. And mm. there's obviously, there's always a reason for it. Mm. But I didn't care. 
Yeah, I you... needed to be that guy that it didn't affect him. Like, yeah, you want to be a superhero. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I was like, I don't care. Like, oh, and everyone around me said, you've put on mm. 20 kilos. You've put on a heap of weight. Like, yeah, like it's, it's kind of like... Of course you're going to be slower on a flying 40. And I was like, I don't care. Mm. Um, so yeah, chasing that sort of unattainable perfection... I think it's going to happen to everyone in everything that they do. I think it's just going to be about how you respond under that situation. So for mm. me, my, my choice was, all right, well, these numbers aren't making me happy. I'll stop looking at them. Mm. Um, it made it hard because I didn't have any KPIs. So my coach would just say yes or no. Mm. And I heard a lot of no's. Mm. But I do very distinctly remember there would have been a good six month period where I didn't get any yeses. Oh, yeah. And wow. it, it got hard and harder. And I, um, I remember that first yes that I got and I was so elated and so overjoyed. Mm. And, um, my coach is a 70 year old, old Dutch guy. He's that very... makes sense though. The best coaches are always the most unexpected <clears throat> of everything, you know? Yeah. And he, I've never seen him so happy, mm. you know, and he'd been out there with me every day, three, like three, four, five times a week Wow, doing our training and, you know, I'm doing hundred meters, 150 meters and dying at the end of each one, and, <laughs> you know, and then we get up and I do my flying work and just no, no, no. And then, yeah, we hit me with a yes and I was so happy. And I think that process, that period of time really taught me that that idea of perfect, mm. it doesn't do anything for you. No, it doesn't. At all. No. It just, if you let it, it hurts you. It infuriates you. It's okay to know mm. that something exists that you might think is perfect. But at the end of the day, it does, it's not going to do anything. No. Nothing it's not positive a positive anyway. driver in no. a sense. It's not something that's going to drive you forward. I can agree with you there. I think that... um you can have this ideal picture in your mind of how things could go, like best case scenario. Mm. And I always talk about that in our, in our podcast. I'm like, you know, you've either got this type of mentality where like everything shit happens all the time and life sucks or, you know, um, I'm setting myself up to think that, that the best possible scenario is going to happen. And yeah. it's interesting that most of the time we land somewhere in the middle. Yeah, a little bell curve. A little, yeah. yeah. And you might get you know, a, a few kind of odd spots down here around, around that mm. nasty end and then you're going to get a few that are really close. But yeah, I would agree with you there that chasing perfectionism is dangling the carrot in front of your own face. You're yeah. doing it to yourself. Yeah. And if that's fuel for you and you know it's fuel and it's healthy and you if can it works, do it, it's not that bad. But yeah. I, I personally, I don't think it's... Like I've looked at video footage of me running in that period of time. Mm. And I've done reps where I, technically, I actually look at it now and I think that is perfect. Give yourself credit. Yeah, I good. actually was running so well. I was mm. moving so well. I was pushing so well. Mm. I actually, you know, I, I wish I could repeat that mm. exact movement every time. Yeah. And I, at the time, was so frustrated and infuriated with myself. Mm. I spent hours watching videos and being like, that's not right. That's not right. Obsessing. And then I watch it again a few months later and I'm like, oh, actually, it was just in my head, I'd convinced myself that it wasn't good. It's, I, I guess we can liken it to anything, any sport that exists. And I think that even, you know, it's interesting hearing this from a perspective of like a sprinter because as bodybuilders, we see pictures of ourselves and mm. we see growth and we, and, you know, we might get like a, I don't know, pinch test done or whatever. And if you're prepared for the worst, and you immediately give yourself a feeling of disappointment if you haven't you know, achieved that per perfect goal. Um, I, I often talk about this with clients, is that if you're not happy with where you are now, and if you can't actually be content with where you are now, you'll mm. never be able to acknowledge the greatness that you've achieved, whether it's up here or whether it's here. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's soul destroying and it's actually really awful for your mental health. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that's actually, that's in that movie, Cool Runnings, that everyone likes to talk about. Yeah. John Candy, the late, great John Candy says, uh, if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. Mm. And that is Dan Henriksen and myself have said that to each other for years. Mm. It's true. Um, 
And we also say, thank you, your dad, mum, and, and jokes. What? From there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to watch the movie again now. <laughs> it's tonight it's happening. Yeah. Uh, kiss my lucky egg. But um, yeah, um, no, it's, it's so true. It's so true. And yeah, being content with yourself before you try and put pressure on yourself. Right. Pressure's fine, but you got to be... You got to make sure you're okay first. Take the foot off the pedal sometimes. Yeah. 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 All right. So first of all, we're going to check to make sure these are still going. Yep, yeah, we're good. Little, our little floofers are still going. Nice. So I'm going to finish up with um, probably the last question before we finish up the podcast because we're, we're just about, I think we're around about an hour soon. Um, actually, I'll make sure I've covered everything. Oh, Sorry, yeah. Carol. Yeah, we've smashed it all. This is so good. All right, so reconvene. Um, <laughs> so the final point before we head off, because we always have to close a podcast with a bit of a banger. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about what your recommendations, because it's interesting. We're practically interviewing, you know, I, I mean, I've done national shows. I'm not a national, well, novice national champion. I've still got to go and take out, actually with one federation, I am a national champion. I lied. <laughs> I forget sometimes. <laughs> I forget that I'm good. No, it actually, it's actually really weird. I do forget sometimes and I'm next to people who've done really well in bodybuilding. I and I'm forget like, that I'm an international athlete. Yeah, because that's, that's what we're talking about, Because I'm right? just a dude. I'm yes. just a guy. Like, we, we don't, no one, unless you're an absolute jerk, no one gets to the stage where they, they take out wins or they take out titles or they go, they go to national championships or they're going overseas for, for comps and things. No one gets there and goes, I'm the fucking best, right? But I want, I want to know, what's your advice for people who seem to think that they're everyday people? Because a lot of people will look at elite athletes and go, that'll never be me. Or, yeah, but that's because you're that type of person. What's your advice for people out there who, um, I suppose because you said you got all those no's before you got your yes, who are wanting to chase a passion or who are wanting to make a big change in their life or who are scared or who are frightened of, you know, starting, going and studying yeah. bloody aviation, like <laughs> Jesus Christ, you know, just completely pivoting in their lives and but chasing nothing but joy and happiness and, and, and being content in, in the pursuit of all things wonderful you're interested in. What's, what's your advice for those, those um, groups of people? So, uh, again, it, it almost comes back to some things that we already talked about it. And, and I had some things happen. We, we all, ha everyone had things happen in their life. It's right? not just us, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I pretty much got to a point where I thought, you know what? I have been given some incredible gifts, I guess. Mm. Or I've been very lucky with a lot of things and I don't think I will be okay if I'm sitting around at 80, 90 years old thinking about what I could have yeah. tried. Yeah. Not done, tried. Mm. Because at the end of the day, anyone only gets where they get to if they try, right? Mm. you mm. got to give it a crack. Mm. Um, and then you most likely have to give it another crack. Yeah. And another crack. Yeah. And another um, so with, I do a little bit of sprint coaching, mm -hmm. um, and the young guy that I am coaching at the moment, the big thing for him is I tell him he needs to work so hard and repeat so often that even a bad rep would be classed as world class. Right. And I think that's something that you could take into just about anything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Practice makes perfect. Yeah. 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 Repeat that's... and fail and repeat and fail yeah, and repeat get up. and fail. Yeah. Fuck, fuck it up and then get up and go again. Like, yeah. Oh, there's a whole lot of fuck have... ups in there. <laughs> Mate, I can't even, you wouldn't even understand how frustrating it is to crash a bobsled when you're driving. Mm. Like you have to do it. And then you are upside down, flying along the ice on your head going, fuck, fuck, fuck. Mm. And then the bob stops eventually and you get out and you pull it out and you pull back to the top and you go back to the top of the track. Mm. And this, this has happened to me. So I, I crashed in Innsbruck on a corner right towards the end of the track. And I knew I would crash again the next run mm. because the whole way down, so could think every about. curve I did, I was not thinking about what I was doing. I was thinking about what was coming. Mm. 
and I crashed again. Yeah. And the guy in the back, Dylan, uh, he said to me, essentially, what the fuck, man? Yeah, get out of your head. What the yeah, fuck? yeah, yeah. You were perfect yesterday. Mm. You were perfect the day before. Mm. All of a sudden, you're crashing. Mm. There's no reason for this. Mm. And it was me. Fear of failure. It was me. Yeah. It's massive, isn't it? I, I was at curve one thinking about curve 11. Wow. I didn't crash again, by the way. <laughs> I just, yeah. And, and that's it, right? And I had to go again. It's like two crashes in a row. I knew I had to go again. Mm-hmm. And I had to try it again. And I could have crashed again, mm-hmm. but I didn't. I worked through it. I worked mm-hmm. through the problem. I shut everything down. I thought, mm-hmm. okay, I just need to count my corners. Mm-hmm. Corner 11, I don't like that number right now. Let's just say that that's corner 10B. Ah. And that's, I found a little way to get past it and that's what I did. Went through, fine, no problems. It was a matter of perspective, wasn't it? Was Essentially, like yeah. Like that, I was doing nothing wrong Mm -hmm. the second time around Mm -hmm. i just didn't give myself the opportunity to do it right because i told myself i was not going to do it yeah i didn't try yeah whereas there was no need to do that yeah i crashed dylan for no reason at all and i felt like an absolute dick (laughs) poor dylan (laughs) great guy absolute 10 out of 10 he's been through a few crashes in his life yeah yeah we both (laughs) yeah (laughs) We've been broken. I'm surprised this is still like ticking the way it is. Mm. You know, it's mm. a few. A well, few concussions knocks. a serious issue. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I've been pretty lucky, but yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I mean, we do wear helmets and we take as many precautions as possible, but yeah, um, just as risky as football, really. Yeah, it, mm. it concerns me. Impact mm. sports. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm a bobsled. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily with bodybuilding, the only risk that we have is probably like doing dangerous shit in the last six weeks of our, of our you know, show, like prep and, and eight yeah. weeks because our brain goes to mush. Yeah, we um, yeah. But I think that's why I like to talk to other athletes because, mm. yeah, there's this common misconception that in sports and even in life, it kind of really does translate into life that people are always willing to look at the risk factor. They're, mm. always, they're always willing to amplify that, you know, yeah. like <clears throat> corner 11 they just want to focus, they want to hyper focus on the shit thing or the thing that they struggle with instead of yeah. focusing on the things that they're good at, um, instead of focusing on what is good. And it is that, it's yeah. not even toxic positivity because I talk about this a lot too. Like, never been a person to say, hey, suck it up and get on with it. Yeah. But certainly, and I spoke about this in a podcast yesterday, um, focus on it for as long as you need to to process it and let it the fuck go. Yeah. Pass yep. then, move Definitely. forward, focus on doing that, and you will. You will get better, even if it takes you six months of, of um, failed six starts. Of <laughs> yeah, that's just. Oh yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Like, because you obviously went the whole sprint. You know, you're actually going the whole way to yeah. only find out that that's. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yep. and six you can't, months of it. Wow. Yeah, six months of. Yeah. Whew. It hurt. Hey, I got a. Um, I actually had a look at the times that my coach recorded, and I was so fucking close. Wow. All every the whole six months, I was so fucking close. Yep. And then, yeah, finally. And it happened. And that's just part of sport. It's part well, of Well, if you, if you give life. up and sit in a heap, you're not going to get it, are you? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to finish up the podcast for today. Um, hopefully, you guys really enjoyed the chats. If you um, have any questions at all about Joe and what he does, don't ask me. I've got no idea other than what, <laughs> <laughs> other than what has happened today. But um, look, we're looking forward to seeing what you get up to in the next few years. And Maybe we'll get you back on again after you've um, got a few more PBs under your belt or, <laughs> or six months of no PBs. But yeah, it's well. it's really interesting to hear about the process involved and it's, it's not all full of big wins. So. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thanks for having me. No worries. Believe thanks a lot, me. guys. Make sure that you tune into the next episode and like, subscribe and share our podcasts, um, even on YouTube as well. Obviously, if you're watching the vlog, it's really important that you get our name out there for plenty of exposure. Thanks. Bye.